mission on Rose's behalf. There's a theory that you can heal, you can heal from trauma done to your ancestors through certain techniques, and Rose is investigating how to do that in reverse. Actually, to heal your ancestors by creating positive space for yourself and trying to reverse that process. Um, and talking about your grandmother on your matrimonial side, yeah, and your mother. Um, did you know your grandmother? Yes. No, I wasn't close to her. She lived in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. She lived in Minneapolis. Um, but yes, I didn't know. Mm -hmm. um, but she was born in... Um, <laughs> she was born in 1901 and I was born in 1967. So it was a huge, huge gap. Um, my mother uh, was born... in Buffalo, so right next to the, uh, our territory, which is in the western part of New York. I don't know if that, that wasn't your question. But no, I, <laughs> I think when I first heard about your show, it made me think of my grandmother, who was like fresh off the boat of Italian, not the same thing. But I remember sort of, like we were not like, close per se when I was growing up, but um, you know, I spent time with her. And then I remember after the fact hearing all of these sort of awful stories of their first experiences in America and it was sort of like I never got to ask her about them. I wonder if that was part of like your family story, your family narrative growing up. Yeah, well part of it has to do with their work. You know, if you're native and you went to boarding school and there's a lot that you never talked about. And so there's a lot that she never discussed with anyone in our family. Mm -hmm. And so this part of that that I was interested in exploring through um, finding out, sort of following oral story around things that happened to her and researching them and then working with them physically through somatic. I can say like a lot more about any one of these things, but I feel like it's easier to just give a little summary and people ask specific questions, and I can do it. Yeah. I don't know where to do that. And I want to say that this is less of a formal Q&A and more just like a discussion. So please feel free to interject with your own questions. I'm just sort of steering the ship. <laughs> well, I have a question about I'm curious about the somatic work. Um, like, in the, uh, informs your photographic. Like, that's like a, like a direct kind of connection, or? Oh, yeah, it's very, very direct. So, I have a. I mean, my background is quite diverse in terms of training, but um, I would say that I spent more of the last. 15 years in somatics than contemporary or ballet or modern dance. Um, and I spent a lot of time doing contact improvisation, which is um, very influenced by body mind centering and um, other somatic techniques. So, um, if, are you familiar with body mind centering? Oh, so, body mind centering works with the systems of the body and they're really sort of, <laughs> I don't know if I should justice to the definition of it. But um, as a practitioner, we study the different systems of the body in different ways, um, hands on. Um, more in an intellectual capacity by reading and drawing and learning very particular anatomy and function, physiology, and then also um, uh, experiential, beyond hands-on, being through movement. And um, so as both a um, practitioner, so someone who did a lot of hands-on work with people, and as a person who teaches, um, I feel like I have like the combination of the two um, integrated into my 
body and then also using this study of the systems of the body to create work. So I started doing that about 10 years ago. And with this, it's even more particular, partially because of Francois, who's um, the composer. He has a very similar background in terms of movement studies. He's been a composer and design engineer for 30 years, since he was a teenager. And um, he studied body-mind centering and massage and zero balancing. And um, so we were interested in how uh, frequency and tone resonate, um, which is a part of body-mind centering, um, learning of body-mind centering. Uh, resonate with the body and affect the body, both as a uh, maker of movement and also as a person watching that movement being expressed. So that's sort of where we started as a collaborative team. And then what I did was I would work with particular images from particular So a good example, I think, is in the beginning, there's a memory, um, so it's my grandmother's first memory, which is of uh, a blood stain on the floor. And um, it was very scary for her, because it, it, um, it stayed there for a long time. They would have been very old and positive. Her grandfather had killed her father, and so the, the blood stain was from him. So there was this trauma that had happened to her. And so um, I work very directly with the idea of um, reversing that memory. And in particular, I work with the um, reproductive system when I created that. Um, the idea of reversing the reproductive system um, so the reproductive system, the ovaries are intended to create new life with this idea of them going backwards. Like, so the, the idea that the ovaries are connected through my mother through her. And so that's where the movement comes from. So it's a combination of things. It's image, it's concept, intellectual concept, it's physical movement that comes out of just like directly connecting the ovaries to like the knees and the feet. There's the sound that's created that is directly resonating within that part of my body as I'm performing that is created by Francois and then there's the um, people witnessing that happen. So it's a very like circular process doesn't happen in a Can I ask if Sheldon Sykes has anything to help him Christ method of movement? With any? I have never studied Feldenkrais. I, okay, I just was... Yeah, no, no, it's a somatic. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's under the somatic umbrella, and um, I've had some Feldenkrais sessions as like a client, but I've never seen <coughs> Feldman Christ, so I've, um, but I don't, I don't know enough about it to say whether or not it is like BMC or not. And then, of course, the BMC that I study is actually global somatics, which is expanded upon, so it actually deals with, uh, the founder of it, she just passed away, um, deals more with energy and, um, than, than BMC does, and also dealt more with sound and voice and resonance. It sort of dove into those areas more extensively. Is that global somatics? Yes. Is, yeah. is it global in the sense of like um, international or global like the whole body? I, just don't I think she called it global somatics more as in the whole body, mm -hmm. but also recognizing, which is something some people don't recognize or acknowledge, that BMC, like most somatic 
things, takes, uh, borrows from other cultures, healing and movement practices. So, for instance, contact improv is a great example. So, Steve Paxton studied Aikido. Um, so there's a lot of Eastern medicine and uh, influence, but there's also other influences as well in BMC. Um, which definitely for me, it, um, as an indigenous person, made some of it problematic because it's very, there's like, there's a definite appropriation happening within the whole somatic world that's not a problem. Yeah. So, in a way, for me, it's like taking back that <coughs> part and using it in a way that works for me. Mm -hmm. I think somatics in particular are so useful to dancers because there's such a direct connection. Um, you know, it's one thing if you're like, you know, that's, you know, it doesn't translate so directly to movement. Um, somatics go sort of like straight A to B. Um, do you find that like teaching what you're teaching is really more to what you're making and what you're performing? Um, I teach another workshop that's more directly related to the creation of this work. Um, it's more improvisation based and deals with things like working with skin and sound, um, a little bit with the bones, but it can, and that is more like how do I get into this work? That's giving people experience of how to get into that space. Mm -hmm. This, the body reeducation work, is something that I studied for a long time and then began to teach um, through Barbara Mahler and it, I would say, <coughs> it's only directly related to my work in that it really is about the individual. Um, I use this when I'm working, when I'm making work on other people, I want them to take my class and I want them to study this, otherwise it's difficult for them to find a way here. Um, but I wouldn't say that doing body education and client technique is going to help someone find a way into my work. I don't think that they're that directly. Mm -hmm. uh, it is if I'm doing groups. I mean, not into this piece in particular. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I, yeah. It's not something that I use in order to make. This is widely taught through in New York. In the city, do you know? Do you have many outlets? No. no, no. Barbara Miller teaches at uh, Movement Research, and then she has a Movement Research, and then there's a couple of other places that she teaches at. Uh, I think she teaches at Billy Young Studio and at um, another studio on Green. On Green. Um, and then Susan Klein has a studio. I don't know if they're still at classes. Um, there are teachers that are certified through Susan Klein that teach, I think, in Europe and South America in New York. And then there are teachers that are, um, Barbara didn't do a certification program. She just sort of did a authorization or blessing or whatever you want to call it. Um, certification seems like an odd thing to do. So she has people that teach there in New York. But as far as I know, outside of New York, I'm the only one that teaches class in the U.S. in another state regularly, like on a weekly basis. Well, I mean, there are other people that have tried to get classes going, but I think that they've had a lot of Trouble. And part of the reason that we're able to do it in Minneapolis is because I, I brought Barbara out to 
Minneapolis um, maybe six or seven times, and then she's also been brought out there by other groups. So she's visited there more than probably any any other place. So there's a a couple generations of people who have also taken class with her there. No, I can't say the number, but I look forward to seeing being part of your class and garden again. Thanks. I learned a lot. Thanks, Ellen. Thanks. Thanks for coming. Um, I have a question. Uh, so, with your background in you know, this healing work and then the larger mission of the piece to like to heal these DNA scars. I'm curious where the balance comes between like doing that work and that research and making an aesthetic piece. Like is there thought about like making it aesthetic at the same time or does the any kind of like like composition storytelling come from like come from just the work? Or is there like a balance of thought? Do you know what I mean? I'm not sure I know what Okay, like, I guess I'm wondering if you, like, so when you're making the work. Yes. Maybe I should just ask about a little bit about your process when you're making the work. <laughs> well, this work is different because it's a solo piece. Okay. So it is the same process that I use to make this work. Okay. Although there are some similar things. So like Katie's was probably an early piece where we worked with skin and listening, which I've probably worked with with several people over the last like six or seven years. Mm -hmm. um, so staying with the subject matter for a really long time. Um, in the process of like creating Threshold, which was also a film, I think we walked for a month. So it's a very long process. Um, in working with other people, because it takes a long time to get into the work. For me, doing a solo piece, it's a matter of structuring out what's already in Shape-based or something that um, 
we seem to have sort of to have them, well, at least in the 90s and early part of the century, uh, sort of two camps, you know, the sort of noodling, feeling, sensing stuff without form, and then like a lot of form over here. And neither of those are interesting to me. I mean, they're interesting to watch. I like to watch people do whatever. But in making work, neither of those are interesting to me. So it's a matter of both. You know, you can noodle and sense all you want, but it's got to be, if you're going to have an audience, to me it has to be interesting to some degree. And that's probably where I veer off from the sort of early, my early teachers who were, you know, people from the Judson Theater who were basically like, we're going to dance, you come watch what we're doing. I'm a little more like, yeah, actually the audience is in the room. And I want to have a relationship with them. I want to explore what that relationship is and how that we can be in relationship to each other um, and not just be in my own world. Although it can come off that way, it's subtle. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Any question? Um, I'm interested. I don't know if you. I missed it, um, but what your ancestry is and what tribe and, and going further, is there a spiritual, you know, teachings or is that centered in, or important? I recently That's a it. very big question. Yeah. I mean, of course my background for me is well, who I am is, in, is key for me in everything that I do. Um, I don't think that one can separate that out of one's work. Right. Um, but I don't create voyeuristic experiences for audience members. I'm not giving somebody a native experience. That's never my... That's, that's never been my goal, and I ever want to do that. I feel like this. I feel like there's enough of that. There's a lot of theater that's about um, educating people. And, um, I think that's fine, and I'm not interested in having that relationship with an audience. Although I think that it's somewhat educational. It's not its intention. Yeah. I don't really talk about um, my, I feel like my spirituality and my, that is sort of like, that's for me, that's my personal yeah. life. Mm -hmm. And even though this is a personal piece, um, yeah. I don't know, talk, talking about it somehow, extracts it from me and it becomes a thing. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Actually, as I was introducing you this morning, I was like, there's so many, so many like label words involved and sort of like, this is this person, this is what they're doing, come see. Mm -hmm. um, and I, do you come, did that sort of annoy you or you're just like, that's the facts of life, kid? Or, I guess that's not a question. It's sort of just the place we're in, right? So, mm -hmm. um, I never said I wasn't native, mm -hmm. um, and but people assumed because I made contemporary dance that I wasn't for years, or they didn't pay attention. They didn't read my bio. Um, but I didn't start saying that I was a Native American contemporary choreographer uh, until a few years ago, and mainly because of that sort of box label piece. Um, for me, I just had to become unafraid of that. Um, and um, I don't know what to say. Yeah, there's a lot of labels and it's weird. You know, most of the time I don't start, I don't put, my bio doesn't say that, it just says I'm Seneca. Um, it has to do with like, it does have someone to do with marketing. 
And it's important to me now because I have a very strong focus on um, building more of a native audience. I've always had some, but I really, um, my goal really is to make native dance, contemporary dance, accessible to native people. And so, um, my putting that I'm a Native American contemporary emperor has more to do with them than it has to do with people who are not indigenous. It has more to do with trying to get them to come to the work or experience the work in a class or whatever. Um, and uh, then it does to try to identify myself to the rest of the world. Although it also does that, it's it's a it's an interesting way to focus. And so I make work that I feel is accessible to everybody, but honestly, the audience that this work is made for are other indigenous people. It is a work that can be experienced by everyone, but they are the people that I offer this work for. So when you write a book or you write a poem or you write a letter you know who you're writing to or for. And it's that that creates a piece that is not voyeuristic in nature because it's not meant to educate or to enlighten people who are not native. Um, does that make sense? It does. Yeah. But it's tricky. Yeah. So this is, it's like what I said in class, like intention to me is 50%. Attention or intention is at least 50% of everything, including making work. Or how one goes about making work or how one presents one to work. Or, you know, and so then would you say semantics is something that should be a regular practice or to get to that place of because the world is changing. Well, semantics is such a huge umbrella for so many different things. So this is like in very a very particular technique. It, it is a it is a technique to train dancers. And um, although you can use it, you know, athletes all the kinds of people can take us, um, and it is helpful. But it is a technique designed to train dancers to move their bodies through space, which is not what the umbrella of semantics is at all. Um, the umbrella of semantics is quite huge. Uh, Katie could probably list for you like 100 <laughs> things that are under semantics. I mean, BMC is very different from from this technique. Mm -hmm. um, and there's some semantics that are not techniques at all. No, right. Like Lama analysis is not, not, not a technique at all. And then there's like even like yoga falls under the semantic right? So they all have really like a static dance is probably under semantics, or you know they all have different sort of intentions and possibilities. Uh, so that we would find is that something? Is it quite different? It, well, it's Klein Mahler technique, yeah. So most of what I teach is, is what I've learned from Barbara Mahler more than it is than what I've learned from Susan because I, I've studied less with Susan. I studied with Susan a very long time ago, but Barbara is my primary teacher, and she's the one that that uh, brought me into teaching. So. But to get the benefits of the technique, too. I mean, I guess it's like with any. Yes, you have to practice. But I mean, you have some sort of like <laughs> seeds of information so you can explore what that is a bit, but really it, one does have to have a teacher in order to, so you have to have somebody with outside eyes to look at the body and to bring up questions and to remind you of things that, that um, Remind you of what 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 you're working on. Um, so yeah, she teaches workshops 
Barbara teaches, uh, like she'll teach you a week off the track this summer. Or you can convince them to bring her back. Mm -hmm. Do you find that most people come to Klein after they've been injured already? Or that it's sort of like the You know, not in my class, but maybe that, I mean, I, I don't know how Barbara would answer that question, but I think that some would say yes. Um, I teach a class in a dance, like an in the morning company class setting. Not that the company comes to my class, so I do, but people don't do that anymore unless they're required. Um, but I probably only had one regular student who came because she was injured. And people pop in because they've been injured and they'll either stay or they won't stay. Sometimes people are looking for something, they don't know what they're looking for, and if they don't find it in the first 15 minutes, they go somewhere else, but they don't have really spent enough time to really figure out if it would help them. Because this, the, this technique is a long process, so it isn't gonna give a quick fix. Um, and it requires the person to do a lot of work themselves, which a lot of people don't really want to do. So, yeah, I think it really depends. We're getting towards the end of our allotted time, not that we can't go over, but if anybody has any final thoughts or questions, you might want to get them out now. I would encourage you to come to the show this weekend. It's Saturday at 8 p.m., Sunday at 7 p.m. Talk to me if you want to come. I can cut you a deal. <laughs> um, and thank you again, Rosie, so much for the wonderful